I've not taught any student online before. Exactly. I've been doing face to face. Yeah. My education was in uh face to face. So mm. I've not had any experience teaching online. Yeah. I'm an old lecturer. And <laughs> I, I, I don't have any business doing with emails. I know, right? I can't navigate my way through WhatsApp. Yeah. I Zoom. can't navigate <laughs> my way through Zoom. I'm yeah. new to all these things. Yeah. So the anxiety brought a bit of mental health issues. Hello and welcome to Brand On Demand, Brand on Demand, the only podcast dedicated to creative entrepreneurs and helping them grow their brands with your host, Brand Guy Mikey. So yeah, this is uh, Brand On Demand and uh, we are glad to be presented with this amazing box from Spicy Girl. Big shout out to all of you guys at Spicy Girl Pizza for hooking us up. And if you want a delicious box like this as well on your table, you can also... Um, you know, link up with them on Spicy Girl Pizza at, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, on all social media platforms. Just jump on their DMs, you know, place your order right here and they'll deliver to you wherever you are in Accra. Uh, would you do me the honors of jumping in? Yeah. So that well, we see yeah. how it looks. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. The aroma is actually killing me. I know, right? <laughs> wow. Oh, my days. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello and welcome back to Brand On Demand. This is the only podcast dedicated to creative entrepreneurs who want to start something out of nothing. And on this episode, we are documenting the entrepreneurship cultures in Africa. And we are discussing the impact of COVID-19 on Ghana's educational system. And I'm glad to be joined by Samuel Ejapon, uh, a thought leader in that industry right here. And uh, welcome to the show, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Before and, uh, we jump in, I think we should sanitize our hands before before yes, we jump yes, in. <laughs> yeah, since so, we are talking so. about COVID nineteen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's getting very serious in our part of the world. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, guys. Uh, is, is our distance okay for us to? You oh know? yeah, yeah. We're, we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're yeah. okay. We're okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah, now that we have that out of the way, welcome to the show, sir. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yes. For having me here, mm. and um, a warm greetings to your audience right. and uh, your your key listeners. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us again. Um, would you tell us a little bit about yourself before we jump into the whole discussion for today? Well, thank you once again. Um, so my name is um, Samonya Kwen Japan, right. um, Ghanaian, uh, born in Accra. Mm -hmm. um, did my whole education in Ghana here from primary to university. Right. Um, I have a master's degree in economics. Right. Um, I did that in the University of Cape Coast. Mm. So I did my first and second degree in the University of Cape Coast, right. uh, reading economics. Mm. Yeah. Um, after school, I joined um, um, an organization called Challenges Worldwide as a volunteer. Right. Yeah, where we volunteer to support um, growing businesses in, in, in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So I worked in Kumasi where I supported um, small-scale industries to, you know, upskill themselves. Um, after Challenges, I joined the Association of African Universities. Yeah. And that's where uh, my interest in educational research started. Okay. So at um, Association of African Universities, I was working on a couple of um, higher education projects. Right. Um, example is the Science Granting Council project, the African Center of Excellence, which is sponsored by the World Bank. Right. And then the Demographics of African Faculty, mm. which is a consortium that looks at the trend of um, students and also faculty members in Africa. And mm. then project into the future, maybe in the next five years, how many faculty members will we need to teach um, the growing number of students? Wow. Yep, yep. That's, so, that's interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> and I, I think um, when you have the chance, I'll, I'll come back again because today we are focusing on COVID. Um, yes. I'll yes. come back again and then talk more about the demographics. I, of I would love I would love to have you on yes, that. Yes. So, <laughs> so in Ghana, when we did the analysis, I'm mm. just giving the high level of it. Um, we, we, we are we are having a deficit in our faculty members who are currently teaching us. So, I see. So, um, uh, public universities would need to recruit um, over 4,000 faculty members wow. um, in, in, in the public universities as it stands now um, based on so in Ghana we have the norms mm. where uh, the norms mean that the standard has reached a university to ha uh, should have yeah. so example universities you have this number of faculty members teaching this particular number of students right. but then most universities are not meeting this norm that's mm. why we have a deficit when it comes to faculty members I and, see um, it will interest you that out of this 4,000 um, 4, faculty members mm. 70 uh, of them 
has to be women. And the statistics that we found around women are serious. So, I see. So 70% yes. of the 4,000 yes, has to be um, women. Yes, I think, yeah, 70, 73% have to be women. Wow. Yes. And um, we also found an interesting um, analysis that out of the 120 full professors in Ghana, wow. only eight are women. Only eight? Yes, only eight are women. I see. So um, gender issues are, are a problem. Uh, it's a problem in, in the Ghana education system. Uh, when it comes to women um, taking on leadership positions in the universities. Yeah. And also um, when it comes to faculty members teaching us. So that's why we have overcrowded in most of our classes. Mm. So I, I, I put myself out there and say, so in my, one of my economics classes in undergrad, mm. we're close to 500 students <laughs> to one, one faculty member. Yes, wow. yes, yes, that was serious. So you go to class and you don't even learn anything. I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. we'll, we'll definitely have to, you know, um, bring that those issues to bear Perfect. Uh, yeah. on this podcast because yes. there are issues that are really disheartening and mm. there are issues that we have to really address and pay yes. attention to yes. right here in Ghana. Yes. The gender balance issues are, you know, taking over the country, but we yeah. will definitely uh, make sure that happens. Sure. And uh, right after here, I'll just put in the, the letter and then send to your mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, right, sure. Right. Um, okay, let me, so let me let me go on with my bio. Mm. Um, so I moved to education sub saharan Africa. Right. Um, Yes, this is a charity that um, uses evidence to improve um, the higher education sector in sub-Saharan Africa. Right. So we don't work only in Ghana. We work uh, in four key countries, Kenya, Uganda, um, Zambia, and Ghana. Right. But then our evidence is very relevant for all higher education stakeholders across mm. the region. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we focus on four key thematic areas which is access, mm. quality, yep. um, relevance. When I say relevance, I mean transition from school to work. Okay. And also making the um, evidence ecosystem within the higher education sector um, wide. So we want to you know, increase the use of evidence in the higher education system or the education system in general. Wow, that's yeah. amazing because yeah. I recently discovered your website. That's yes. SR, right? Yes. And I discovered that it's more like a hub for scholarships. Perfect. So yeah. if you guys want any information on where to get scholarships yes. for your undergrad or postgraduate you know, studies, mm -hmm. make sure you um, log on to SR. Uh, I'm going to leave the links down in the description yes. right here. So yeah, go check them out. It's, it's an amazing platform and yep. it's an amazing charity. And what you guys are doing, I really want to commend you guys for you know providing you know research information and research you know yes. uh, learnings for you know a lot of some of the topics that you know need attention right here yes. in Ghana yeah. and uh, you are an evidence impact and uh, learning, manager. learning manager yes what what what, what is that actually this well, is my, that's my first time hearing <laughs> hearing hearing that well it's 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 a math for if you want to mention my yeah, position yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, I, I I normally prefer go like um, research research manager. That, okay, that that sounds good for me. Yeah, right. So um, evidence impact learning manager. What I basically do is mm. um, what ESA does. So use evidence, mm. um, turn these evidence into practical solutions. Right, and then also track these evidence that we we produce. So um, basically, my work now focuses on um, tracking our contribution to the education um, sector. Right. Um, so um, as I mentioned our approach, so we identify the challenge mm. within the higher education sector. Then we do um, research or we create evidence in this sector, right. in these um, themes that I mentioned. Then we turn these evidence into practical solutions, one of which is what you mentioned. Mm. We have a scholarship hub yeah. where students can go on this hub and then look for scholarship opportunities. Right. Right. And then um, the other ones is that we also um, have the African Jobs Board. There's a project that we are doing with the Association of African Universities. Right. And as I mentioned, there is a deficit when it comes to faculty members in Africa. So why don't we open that up so that somebody from um, the states anywhere that they find themselves in the world can apply to opportunities within these universities in Africa. Right. So it increases student uh, faculty mobility and then also solves the faculty crisis in Africa. That's amazing. Yes. That's amazing to yes. know. Yes. Wow. Thank and you so much for joining yeah, us. Uh, we, we, l l let me add um, give another, it to me. another Drop practical it. <laughs> solution that yeah. we have. Mm. So we have also the research um, that we call it the AERD, the African 
uh, research hub. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So with this hub, researchers or faculty members right. can go on there and look for um, papers that have been published within the African region yeah, in education. So, oh, okay. Um, like a Google Scholar, but for... Perfect. Wow. Like a Google Scholar, but for Africa and I focusing see. on education. Right. So you go there, you find the research that has been done by faculty members within the space. Mm -hmm. And this is to improve the um, evidence ecosystem in Africa. Wow. Yes. So coming to, coming to our main topic for today, yes. Yes. the impact of COVID-19 on the Ghana educational system. You know, uh, first and foremost, uh, COVID-19 is, is a health issue. Yep. You know, and one of the challenges that most governments are facing is trying to rechannel all their resources or mm -hmm. some of their resources mm -hmm. to fight and combat, you know, the COVID-19 since we don't have a substantial, you know, uh, yes. vaccine yet. You know, coming down to Ghana here, um, we recently opened schools. The government mm -hmm. recently opened, you know, universities, colleges. And um, one thing that is on my mind now is that are we supposed to, are we going to open schools? so that you know health workers you know um teachers lecturers and everything can go yeah. to work and then mm -hmm. you know at least at least have some you know um resource to you know push themselves and push their families yep. or are we going to close down schools so that we can prevent the spread of covid 19. yeah that is a dilemma that is on my mind right now and i think <laughs> that a lot of people are also being faced with this you know question yeah um uh, i think most governments don't know what to do at this point so some uh, universities are, are partially open mm -hmm. some are doing the you know face to face and then the online as well so they yep. call it the hybrid learning system perfect right and uh how has that been because i recently discovered uh, one of your papers called yes. learning in crisis, crisis yeah. and i find that very you know um interesting could you share a little bit ab about that on some of your learnings that you came up with <laughs> so let me let me take your question from a broader perspective right and once you narrowed it on ghana mm. let me focus also on ghana right. as well um you rightly said mm. the government has a dilemma mm. uh, parents are also having dilemmas yes. faculty members um students right. are also all, all in this dilemma mm. but then i think the government in a way has done a very good job mm. um they've used data and evidence very well in order to allow students back on campus right or you know even at a lower grade level to allow them back on campus um i think it's it's been a lot of data analysis a lot of understanding of the virus and all that yeah um but then from my research and what i've come to learn and understand is that um there are key things that the government or we need to do in order for us to resume back into um the education uh, resume education again that's fully right that fully right. yes and um how education will be will be based on the institution uh in question mm. so some institution have the capacity yeah to do both blended and then uh, to do a blended learning mm. which is having students partially go to school uh mm. face to face and, and then also online. use online right some institution also have the capacity to go fully online okay yeah and some other universities do not have the capacity so they will resort back to the face to face and mm. this is what has happened when schools reopen in ghana mm. um, we've had some schools having a hybrid system right. so i can mention the university of ghana because they have the capacity to uh, so they have students running shifts so some part of students will go in classrooms and then others will be doing online right. and then there will be a shift system where they go and that way too and it is also important for me to highlight that this is based on program level or discipline right so some disciplines they can afford to have their students have face-to-face -face classes mm. because the number of students are few others are having really large number of students so yeah. they have resorted to the hybrid system um, when you go to institutions like um, Ashasi they have the capacity to go fully online yeah. because even during the peak of the COVID season, they were able to write exams online and even graduate students online. online right. You understand? So they have the capacity. Let me go to other universities that were even doing online before 
the incidence of the COVID, which is Lawa University, right. um, Nigerian Open University, right. um, Tanzania Open University. So these were open universities that had the systems in place already. Right. So in Africa here, these are some of the key institutions. And when you go to South Africa today, these institutions with the um, capacity to fully move online. Right. Yeah. But because of the digital divide, most of these uh, institutions in the sub region do not have that capacity, hence, uh, will resort to face to face um, teaching and learning. Like, um, example, the smaller universities in Ghana, right. um, UPSA, um, uh, 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 the technical universities, universities, right? Yeah, and all those in Ghana that do not have the capacity. So, um, one back to your question, it depends on the capacity of the university, it depends on the resources within the university, and it depends on student and faculty readiness right. to um, learn during this crisis period. I think that, um, like you mentioned, right, capacity. Perfect. Most of yeah. these institutions, you know, or universities mm -hmm. are not, you know, fully fleshed to meet the demands of the digital blend. Yes. You know, and what is happening is that uh, lecturers are not ready mm -hmm. to, you know, um, migrate online yes. students are not ready to migrate online yep. you know so they are being forced to and it's creating traffic um yes. some lecturers do not ha do not know how or do not have the technical <laughs> know-how yes. to operate online yes. some students also do not have access to you know um, some high-speed internet to Perfect. stay online yeah. so there are so many problems that are you know coming up yes but one question that i would want to ask you right is that was it I don't want to be political or anything, <laughs> but was it a good move? Because opening schools partially, mm -hmm. right, is still opening schools. You yes. Know? Um, but let me let me answer this. Uh, I don't want to answer it with a question, but then yes. let me let me try. So, yeah. opening school, I think, is is in the right direction. Okay. And once the COVID protocols are being um, followed, and the main reason for closing schools is because of COVID, right? And to stop the spread of COVID. Yes. But what if we have measures in place um, to stop the spread among students? They obey the social distance rule. They use their sanitizers. They wear their nose masks um, in classes and. Uh, within the school compounds that they find themselves. Now we've come to understand the COVID more than it was before. Right. That is why even as low as 300 uh, cases, we close schools. But now we have come to understand we do mass testing and all that right. uh, in place. So uh, I think opening the schools is, is good for us because think of this. Yeah. While schools were closed, some students were learning. Yeah. Some students who could afford it were learning mm. because they have the digital means because they could afford buying internet because their institutions had the capacity to teach them online yeah but have you thought of those schools who are in the rural areas yes schools got shut down for them mm. they didn't have any means for learning again yes they didn't have any means uh to interact with their faculty members or their teachers so after the COVID, there has been a gap created mm. and how do you fill this gap so i think opening back schools again it's important for um the um the more disadvantaged people right than the advantaged people yeah i think that the whole you know um i'm not saying COVID is good but the whole COVID situation has really opened you know uh, yes, many many more. gaps in in our system yes. because now we are we not we notice that there's there's a lot to do when it comes to the educational system yes. right here in ghana uh recently right uh when schools reopened mm -hmm. um uh, in january right upsa gave um as as uh, part of their measures to combat the you know the, the, the spread of COVID nineteen, yes. they give um, some you know personalized uh, learning materials to their lecturers, Perfect. and they also reduce the number of students who were supposed to be in one particular class at, at yes. a particular time, yes. and they are, I think they are running the hybrid learning system right now. Yeah. But my question is that mm -hmm. because. The experience online is different from the experience on face to face. Yes, it you is. know, yeah. and some students are going to do better online, and some students are going to do better face to face. Yes, um, you know, <laughs> well, that that doing better yeah. depends on the quality mm. um, of teaching and learning. Exactly. Yes, but we don't have we don't have the measures to put, to migrate online for you. That is yes. the problem. We we started with the emergency. So you mentioned that it's it's on earth a lot of gaps that yes. is true yeah but then there is an opportunity to exploit okay and the opportunity is moving online 
and that is where the future goes. Okay. And even when you look at after education, the labor market, right. the labor market is also shifting to online. Right. So then it's important that universities also shift uh, to either hybrid or online learning. Right. And this will create the skills for them, uh, for students. It also create the skills for faculty members to improve on their teaching and learning. Right. Yes, I understand the um, gaps that people are raising that uh, it leads to inequality among students and all that. Mm. Yes, that's why we are having students on campus, but then we are still doing the hybrid system like UPSA you mentioned is doing. Right. So um, the key thing here is to have a quality assurance of the courses that they are teaching online right. and even the courses that they are teaching face to face so that we have a same quality for it because when you go, this same story that we are we are saying or we are we are narrating would it would be a different case when you go to harvard when you mm. go to oxford when right. you go to a, a very developed country because they have the structures they have um the systems in place to undertake this but right. we don't get there easily we we have to go gradually mm. that's why i think upsa has proposed going the hybrid way and then this will improve student learning i think also student learning depends on one the institution and you could see the institution is putting a lot of um, um infrastructure for for this to happen yeah they are giving students um learning materials they are giving faculty learning materials and i suppose they are also training students on how to learn online yeah faculty members how to learn uh teach online so in a way they are improving their readiness to do this and they also um they have the staff or support staff in order to support this migration right, right. they have the systems in place i hear they are using sakai and all these mm. uh learning, learning platforms, platforms yeah. for students so um i think gradually we will get there and um i see COVID as an opportunity to push us uh to increase access to education for a lot of people right yeah within a sub region mm. yep. Hello and welcome to Brand On Demand, brand on demand. the only podcast dedicated to creative entrepreneurs and helping them grow their brands with your host, Brand Guy Mikey. But I feel say, like many many of these people there, eh, their life depends on whether an educational system is mm-hmm. effective when yeah. it comes to like we they move online. Yeah. You about because if you they move online, if you move everybody, if you have the available yes, resources. resources, yeah. But if you don't get the resources, it means that you for let some people go. Yeah, that be where the institutional culture they come inside. Mm. What be the institution? What be the identity? What mm. be the culture? Right. You about.